name is Rural Pascual. I am the art director at Night School Studio. Uh, after the party is not out yet, so you guys will have first look at a lot of the art in the game. Are you guys excited? Yeah. All right, let's do this. Cool. All right, uh, it's good to be back in the Bay. I actually went to school here at the Academy of Art uh, in 1997. Uh, I studied illustration, computer animation, and I've been creating art ever since I was a kid in the Philippines. Uh, here's some of my personal work. I love working in traditional medium. Uh, a lot of my old paintings are inspired by my wife and kids. Uh, my art has been featured at galleries in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City, and San Diego Comic Con. I taught myself uh, sculpting and learned how to make molds and resin castings. Uh, it's always great to uh, able to work on something tactile and take a break from the computer. And of course, I also like working in digital. Uh, I try to post as much uh, personal work as I can. Uh, these are a few of the sketches I uh, sometimes post on Instagram. And I also like modeling, rigging, and animating uh, characters and creating test scenes in Unity. So I've been fortunate enough to work for some innovative companies throughout my career. Uh, I started in 2002 here in the Bay Area. So here are some of the games and projects I've worked on. In 2014, Sean Crankle and Adam Hines started Night School Studio with their first game, Oxenfree. They're actually right there. <laughs> Say hi. It's <laughs> nice. Uh, so I, cr I was able to create all the rigs for the characters in Oxenfree, as well as serving as an animation consultant. Uh, in 2016, Sean hired me full time to work on a Mr. Robot mobile texting narrative game where I designed the UI and UX. Today I'm gonna to talk about the art of after party. As art director, I focus on visual identity, color, lighting, rigging, animation direction, and branding. With a small studio, studio you have to make, uh, you have to wear many hats. Uh, it was a big challenge for our team, so we had some failures before ultimately finding success. Here's our logo designed by our graphic designer, Diana Kwok. Uh, we decided to create our own version of a chromatic aberration effect in this one. Our first challenge was team size. Oxenfree was made of a core of six people. With After Party, we doubled the size of the team. In production now, we have almost tripled it. This was our bike bar pub crawl in Venice Beach last year. You know, our research. Uh, at night school, we are really proud of the studio culture and chemistry and story games we all love to make. So let's talk about story. So the story of After Party. Two besties since uh, kindergarten, Milo and Lola, mysteriously die ap after graduating college. They both go to hell, but they find a loophole that if you outdrink Satan, you can grant your life back on Earth. So the tone of the game, we wanted a fun, humorous, excellent adventure like Bill and Ted, a crazy, busy, crowded nightlife like Shibuya, Japan, and a story with a lot of heart like Beetlejuice. So we came up with these three little words, comedic, alive, and heart. Comedic in story, dialogue, and animation. Alive, a world where a ton of demons and humans coexist. Heart, a story about a friendship that lasts through the afterlife. The three little words are an emotional experience that the player should feel when they're playing this game. They're basically our three pillars. So our amazing writers, Adam Hines and Hannah Filipski, would create the bones for the story, and art and design fleshes it out. So what's our vision for this sophomore walk and talk branching narrative game? The vision for After Party was to create a distinct handcrafted art style with a similar gameplay like Oxenfree. Story is important to us. The player is able to drive the direction of the story so the narrative the player chooses becomes one of the core mechanics of the game. So what's our version of hell? After Party straddles the fine line between dark content but still being fun 
in a vibrant world. We wouldn't want to be too grotesque or too cliche. We are very careful in balancing tone, art, and design. So our goals for this one are much more ambitious this time around. How many of you have played Oxenfree? Awesome. So I, for you that haven't, Oxenfree is a single player game that's equal parts coming of age tale and a supernatural thriller. The gameplay is a walk and talk branching narrative where the player can influence the story in a meaningful way. Our goals for After Party, we wanted to create a full 3D game, two playable characters with a ton of NPCs, environments, with complexity in design and story. So we had a few inspirations. We looked at a lot of Simon Weiner's photographs, the way he captures light and shadow in his photos, which gives you a mysterious, eerie feel. We imagine your art uh, to have saturated lights hitting buildings at all times. Interior lights and neon signs became some of the main light sources for the game. We were also inspired by the art of Neil Campbell Ross. His design sensibility, use of color combinations, shape languages, and how he composes his characters in his paintings. We kind of like the haphazard, rickety architecture he created for Hotel T, uh, how shadows were designed inside the overall shape of the structure. Jamie Hewlett's Gorillas was also a big inspiration for the character designs, fashion, edginess, and grit. The rendering and lighting for our character was inspired by the scene in the movie called Belly. You guys remember it's directed by Hype Williams, uh, where crowds are bathed and lit by multiple colored lights. You can see this beginning in the movie, it's a slow-mo shot, so uh, as they walk into the bar, um, there might be a trailer for it. So anyway, speaking of trailers, uh, let's look at the After Party trailer, if you haven't already seen it. So, each department had a hand in making this trailer. Uh, as a small studio, you kind of have to. So all of it was captured in game footage. Milo, how long have we been friends? Our entire lives. Our whole entire lives. And so I want you to understand that I'm not blaming you for getting us killed and sent to hell. Two, uh, what do you want? Two dead orphans. And I'm not even saying how drinking Satan to get back home is the worst idea you've ever had. Okay, well, Lola, what are you saying? Pace yourself. Uh, Lola, can you get alcohol poisoning in hell? All right, let's talk about visual targets. Uh, we start off with illustrations uh, created by amazing artists Claire Chen and Beverly Chen. No, they're not related. Uh, What's a crazy night out in hell look like? Uh, debauchery, rollicking fun, tomfoolery. Those are some of our demons uh, in the game. <laughs> we wanted to lean into bright colors and dark shadows by using volumetric spotlights to center the action. We created a drinking minigame to, to, similar to the drinking game in Indiana Jones. You guys know Pastore. Our protagonist had to practice drinking with other demons in order to beat the of partying. So for this illustration, with drinking at your disposal, we wanted to show how they might act when they start to get a little drunk. We brainstormed with our marketing manager, Kylie Moses, from a brand perspective on how moments we can show our fans the tone and art style of the game. For an indie company, we don't have the huge marketing budget, so we try to share as much production art as we can with our fans on social media to keep them excited and in the loop. 
Neon signage helped fill the gaps of darkness and extend color choices we have in this world. Quiet moments are outside, and the party ends inside the bars where most of the story moments and quests happen. Our designers, sound designers, Scientific and Eduardo Ortiz Frau help party atmosphere with the run of the jewel style music tracks. We also have an incredible cast of voice actors on After Party. Koi Dao as Milo, Janina Gavankar as Lola. Drinking is a mechanic in the game. We have demon bartenders that can serve you a variety of drinks which you can use to color your dialogue choices. It's kind of like cosplaying with drinks. Here are a few example drinks that you have in the game. So when you take a drink, a third dialogue bubble pops up and opens a new branch in the story. We call the dialogue option Liquid Courage. So one of our biggest challenges was art. Luckily, we have a talented art team at Night School Studio. So Oxenfree lends itself to a muted color palette with a soft painterly style. For After Party, a vibrant color palette and neon signs were a big jumping off point for the look and feel of the game. Since players will spend most of their time in bars, we wanted exterior and interior spaces to have a modern city feel, yet showcase a primitive historic hell vibe. Here's some exploration of shape language and building designs and how each level might be composed. Our hell composes of different islands on the river Styx. The game is side-scrolling, similar to Oxenfree, but using a perspective camera. We use lava mountains as our backdrop to populate the world, along with molten waters where you can take a hell ferry to each location. You also meet a cab driver named Sam Hill, where she can take you from bar to bar. So even in hell, you shouldn't drink and drive. Samantha Hill is kind of the character in the Die Hard movie, Argyle. So she's kind of like your tour guide slash parental figure in the game. This is the concept art for the first level of the game. We chose the color red to acclimate the player to the world. We wanted hell to have a familiar initial vibe so the player can cross the visual threshold. We did lava waterfalls, college town kind of atmosphere with long lines, like at the DMV. You know, hell. Uh, this one's inspired by a college town of USC. We built uh, a bunch of sports bars, dorms, a great hall, libraries, a park, and the scales of justice in the background. This is also where Milo and Lola discovered they are in hell, so we wanted the player and the characters to be on the same page in the story. This bar is called Feisties. It's your typical sports bar where you can play drinking games, beer pong, and watch demons play sports on television. This concept was inspired by the boroughs of New York City. Demons over time created their own urban landscape that has been haphazardly put together and stacked over the years. So after the player settles into our version of hell, we start to then break away from the hell tropes or stereotypes we all know. We start to introduce color variations within each island or zone to match the tone and fun, colorful nightlife of the game. This level was inspired by the busy nightlife of Shibuya, Japan. In the after party, we have mini games woven into the story and each have a purpose to advance the player. You can just hear Disco Inferno playing in the background. In a bar called Skull, you can have a dance-off mini-game DDR style with a demon to gain your suspect for a possible quest payoff. This club was inspired by the BDSM club in LA called Bar Sinister. Sean, you've been there, right? Allegedly. All right. <laughs> this level of Little Brentelia was inspired by the architecture of Washington, D.C., where courts and hell monuments reside. Uh, this is the oldest location uh, in hell. To the left is where Satan fell from heaven. There's a big hole now, and it became a natural tourist attraction and a great selfie spot. The gates of hell are also in the background. This is where all the poor souls walk to get tortured. Below that is a club called Sealed Knot. So the design was inspired by catacombs uh, in Paris. 
Uh, our interior spaces also have a familiar but mysterious look. And the sealed knot is our version of a speakeasy where only demons are allowed inside. Our lead designer, Joe Gatling, designed all the levels along with art and story themes to which we had a fair amount of variation and nostalgia to complement the tone and story. With months of concepting, the next challenge was our vertical slice. So this zone is called First and Izzard, where you can find your first typical dive bar. We started to call out assets we would need to build in 3D. This bar, the schoolyard strangler on the far right, where you can take your first drink in hell. Our camera is a lot closer to the characters in this game. So we wanted more depth in the middle ground, foreground and background. So we want to create that parallaxing uh, in this game. The construction and design for the bar, the schoolyard strangler, uh, was inspired by an old church in New York City uh, that was later converted to a club uh, in the 90s uh, called the Limelight. My wife, uh, Samantha, has been there when she was a teenager, I think during like the hip hop nights or something. Uh, so now I think it's a CrossFit gym, which is kind of sad. Uh, we were going to go with modular uh, design and only create bars that we interact with. The plan was to create basic looking buildings to fill the structures and gaps between the background. We started to build a prop library uh, we can distribute and reuse in the entire game. So we started to model uh, street lamps, street signs, gates, uh, saint monuments, uh, rocks, and tombstones. We also started to think about the texture quality we wanted to put inside the, each model. We modeled 3D trees, trash cans, dumpsters, piles of human skull. Also a library of torture devices that hints at uh, the activities during demon work hours. Eric Romano, one of our 3D artists, uh, created this prototype. Uh, we first started with no textures and tried to experiment with volumetric lights and emission. He then modeled and textured a sample bar. Here we decided to figure out the poly count of each model and texture detail. Then I started to assemble the scale of the world and figure out how dynamic lighting was going to work with effects and fog. Working with the post-processing stack in Unity, we wanted to see how much we can get away with with minimal color grading. You can kind of see Alex from Oxenfree hanging out. She was kind of our test model for the scene. So after modeling and texturing finished for the buildings and props, I started to assemble our vertical slice in Unity. As we progress with the first level, we start to find visual fidelity problems. The Unity terrain and the models just look like any other 3D game. We weren't getting the handcrafted look we were going for with basic lighting and texturing. Plus, it nearly took months to model and texture the vertical slice. This was just one exterior location. We still had a ton of interior spaces to build. We were losing detail that our artist created in the concept art. And it wasn't coming through at all in the 3D environments. At this point, we, were meet, we weren't meeting our original vision for the game. This is the concept art we started with. So does it look like we'd have hit our original vision? Nope. Something in our process had to change. Sean Crankle, our co-founder and studio director, called an all-hands meeting to talk about our challenge. We had to pivot. In a small studio with limited resources and people, we had to take a step back and look how we made Oxenfree. Every game is different, and each will have its own problems. Uh, it was just taking a long time to build each zone, and the usual pipeline wasn't getting us there. We weren't able to execute the vision we had hoped for. So sometimes, Failure pushes you to cre creatively solve problems. So we asked ourselves, so what's been done before that worked? Oxenfree lead artist Heather Gross created this look and feel and was translated in a game engine using sprites with an orthographic camera. 
By pointing out the reason for our failure, only then is when we can start to learn to fix them. For After Party, we wanted a concept art, concept art to have a direct line into modeling. We were kind of losing all of our artists' work in the process. So we had to bridge the gap between concept art and in-game art. Basically, make the game look like the artwork. Uh, so people don't realize how hard that is to do. Uh, seeing it in concept art, standing it up and building it, laid out, and how it's modeled, shaded, animated, and how it looks in the scene through a camera. That's a really difficult task. But the devil's in the details. We communicated to the entire team that the vision of the game wasn't being fulfilled. After an all-hands meeting, we worked together in figuring out a new pipeline. We wanted the in-game environment art to look like the concept art, but with more depth and work with real-time lighting. Here's how we did it with our new pipeline. So we went back to the drawing board. We set out to create a small exterior and interior space to test out our new pipeline. We found an immediate success with a new technique. I can show you a result of these two a little later, but the solution was how geometry was modeled, how artists created the concept art in Photoshop, and a new shader written by our lead developer engineer, Brian Cannon, that bridged the gap of concept art into in-game art. Concept art had to be painted uh, uh, on how we want to see it in the perspective camera. This was our new vertical slice for Cinezard. Our artists would hand the concept art to our modelers, Eric Romano and Alex Chavez. They would then rotoscope the concept art, model the car's geometry precisely around each piece. Then the geo gets UV'd and broken out into separate maps. So there's still a fair amount of 3D in the game. The terrain, the doors, the lamps, and anything the characters had to interact with were 3D. The rest were just simple cards that were pushed and pulled to cheat the perspective camera. Here's how the scene is broken down to show you the 3D geometry. We used the Polybrush Texture plugin for the terrain, which gave us three texture channels. A custom shader was designed to seamlessly blend the art with the lighting and modeling. We called it the bartender shader. So we tried just using the Unity light mapping, but it didn't achieve the nuances of the concept art. Since our 3D geometry budget was so limited, the solution was to add a texture input to the standard shader that acted as a custom light map. So the custom light map uh, just included stylized highlights layer that is basically a special emission layer that multiplies the light value by the albedo. The textures would then be passed back to our artists Claire and Beverly to create the albedo light map and emissive layers in Photoshop. Light maps were used to add color and rim lights to the gray middle value of the albedo. They had to be separate from the albedo so our artists can have more flexibility when balancing the textures with the real-time lighting. Here's how the artists layer their files in Photoshop. All the light map layers are set to multiply. Emissive maps are painted in for parts that emit lights, so when the lighting is baked, in turn affecting our characters and the environment. Along with normal maps, metal and rough textures to provide added depth as well as specularity. With this new pipeline, we empowered our artists to have more contributions and flexibility in production. Our modelers then would receive the painted textures and start to assemble the scene in Unity. I would then start to light the scene and closely reference the concept designs we originally started with. This is our original concept art. Did we hit our original vision? Yes. We found success. These are just the 3D assets of the game engine a bit of Unity Fog and utilizing the post-processing stack in uh, Unity. Our new pipeline helped us achieve the new vision. So here's a comparison of the old 3D pipeline and the now scalable, successful 3D pipeline. So bringing back those two 
uh, exterior space after we pivoted, uh, we extended the model now and it's a full level in the game called Odds Vatican's. So I had to speed up the, uh, the image here so you guys can see the entire level of the game. Here's the first interior space we built, uh, concept art above and the game running below. With the new technique and pipeline, we now have learnings to leverage any concept art style we want. Now that we successfully had the environment art style and pipeline working in game, how do we design characters and scale the world of After Party? How do we make environment art look alive? How do we approach character modeling, texturing, rigging, and animation with a ton of characters? We wanted a variety of shapes and sizes for all of our main characters and NPCs. Adam Hines wanted Satan to be twice the size and be the most prominent and interesting silhouette in the game. All of our characters had to be 3D and they're all modeled in Maya and ZBrush. So starting with our protagonist. So here's Milo's initial character designs. I uh, we went through a few changes. Uh, we started off with cardigans, trench coats, sporty jackets, Air Jordans, and jeans. Our characters' colors had to complement each other since they're going to be together all the time. Uh, with Milo, we chose a simple, clean design with a yellow cardigan, jeans, and purple hair that echoed his personality. So Milo's backstory, he's an only child, uh, intelligent, and skated through college with ease. Uh, his fear of rejection stopped him from making new friends. So the choices we made for his designs were indicative of his uh, personality. Uh, so you have purple hair, like I'm cool, um, open collared shirt, I'm kind of up for anything. Uh, button <laughs> cardigan, I'm reserved, open, kind of sloppy, but don't care. Uh, jeans and carmers, uh, meaning I'm ready for an adventure. So here's the 3D model to the left and concept art on the right. So here's Milo's designs, texture sheet, and poly count, and using the standard, uh, standard Unity shader. I think we got down to around 8,000 uh, triangles for his model. So Lolo went through a few versions as well. Classic leather jacket, jean jacket, ripped jeans. For her hair, we really embraced the iconic, thick, kinky hair that subtly bounces. She definitely had to be a badass. but edgy and fashionable at the same time. So it went to classic 1990s overalls, old school and trendy, uh, rip stockings and Doc Martens, meaning I've been in a few fights and totally kicked some ass. So Lolo's backstory, um, she's the youngest of four sisters. Uh, her sisters are kind of uppity and materialistic, so she's just happy to be done with college and wants to really make a difference in the world. So we have our concept art on the left, and the model on the right. So here's our designs, model, textures, and hair cards. Our modelers really did a great job in just translating our characters into 3D. I think uh, Lola's uh, model uh, is around 10,000 triangles. So the characters' clothing and textures create a vision of the characters' experiences and lives and roles they have in the game. Yellow was a unifying color they both carry that can read from a distance. Since we were designing two playable characters, their outfits and colors had to read clearly. In After Party, uh, in order to get out of hell, their friendship had to be put to the test. Uh, for Satan, so we wanted his design to be iconic and familiar. Uh, you know, he's been running hell uh, for over a million years. And so Adam had this idea of layering fashionable clothes over time to kind of beef himself up. His personality is a cross between Kanye West and Dr. Frankenfurter from Rocky Horror Picture Show. So Satan's backstory, he's the first kid in heaven that was uh, put into detention. So in hell, he runs the party 24 hours a day, uh, every day, for centuries. 
his design was so crazy, so we were wondering how we were going to model him and kind of stay in a decent poly count. So from concept art, it was going to be a challenge, but we did it. Uh, Eric Romano, Claire Chen, and I tag team and how to build him correctly. Uh, Satan's model, I think, clocks in at around 13,000 uh, triangles. So the next problem to solve was how to do the rig, how to animate all these characters. So how do we bring all these characters to life in After Party? They had to have cool outfits, strong design shape, posture and animation that caters to their personality type. So for rigging, we use Anzovin's setup machine for games, the super cool, easy rig, uh, rigging tool that bakes animations and exports uh, FBX files. So in Maya, we also use a plugin called Studio Library where you can save, transfer animations and poses. We are also uh, able to use blend shapes for human faces and human masks. We are able to transfer all the blend shape atoms across each mask type. Their personalities, Lola is protective, snarky, and independent. Milo is friendly, nervous, and a square. The, the animation had to communicate emotions and personality clearly for the acting to read from a distance. They had to be comedic, alive, and have a lot of heart. So Satan was a huge complicated character with layers of clothing and props. It was just a big challenge for his rig to work properly. So I started to experiment with cloth component in Unity. I kind of just started off with a simple banner flag to kind of figure out how it works in Unity. Uh, so now we added cloth dynamics and digital, uh, just rigid bodies to help our characters uh, feel alive and to get that free overlap and follow through in the animation. So I had to group all the, and combine all the right pieces to reduce the amount of draw calls we have. So we have uh, his feathers were cloth, uh, his necklace and the skulls around his neck are all rigid bodies. Um, we also added colliders, so the colliders would push and uh, prevent penetration of the cloth around it. The materials and shaders was another obstacle to cross with our characters. So how do we render them similar to our concept art so they feel part of the game environment? Their textures had to come through in the models as well as seamlessly fit into new, the new environment, modeling, and lighting. They look great with just an ambient occlusion GI style rendering with a simple background with the standard Unity shader, but it just wasn't working at all seeing them clearly with uh, our busy environment scenes. So our lead engineer, Bryant, had to create a custom tune shader for the characters as well. We call it bar tune shader. It consisted of three layers. So we wanted the lights to have a bright saturated colors, but that washes out all the bright varied colors we put into the characters' textures. We needed a custom shader to keep all the local colors consistent through each lighting situation. So the bar tune shader, it has base lighting which uh, calculates the global illumination input from the light probes, a standard tune shader that desaturates the light source so the local colors pop even though the light source is saturated. The harsh rim light picks up any colored lights on the edges of the character. So the top GIF uses the standard shader and the bottom GIF uses the Bartoon shader. Now you can clearly see that our characters as they cross that dumpster fire light source, uh, you can see the local color, color as well as seeing that rim wrap uh, lighting around the edges. Lighting, uh, we also want it to look like the illustrations. So how do we render volumetric lighting with a ton of characters? The engineers uh, and designers were swamped, so we picked up uh, an HX volumetric lighting from the Unity store. Uh, but later on, our engineers uh, 
we wrote the, the shaders and um, lighting and made a fake volumetric light for each character. Uh, so they kind of saves us on just any Unity uh, caching. Uh, we had one directional light that's a shadow caster. The rest were point lights that were just light probes that were baked into the environment. So I designed one of the characters named Sister Mary Wormhorn, um, Milo and Lola's personal demon. In hell, you just don't get tortured physically. You also get tortured mentally by creatures birthed from your subconscious fears. Uh, blend shapes on their arms were also there to kind of create that nice noodly uh, shape. We also added a mission layer to the Bartoon shader to help with glowing masks and other props like Christmas lights and lampshades. With animation, we wanted to push the timing, acting, and hilarity. Uh, here's one of our party demons, Asmodeus, is doing the Running Man. Now let's look at both environment and characters working well together at our vertical slice first in Izzard. The bartender shader and the bartoon shader in action. With one of uh, our three little words being alive, how do we design all the NPC crowd characters? We had the idea of demons wearing masks and glowing eyes to visually represent them and tie them to this world. We also played with different proportions to vary their belt line or hip height. We also gave them unifying skin color but grounded them by adding clothing. In contrast, humans have dot eyes and have a variety of skin tones and outfits. We created a variation of horns and mask types for our demons. We reference a lot of different outfits that span across different times and cultures. We were able to scale out each rig type by having a variation of hair props and texture swaps, as well as changing their body mass with blend shapes. Later on, we start to give them cause of death props for just interesting gags. So another challenge was managing the crowd and NPC characters. How do we make our environments look alive? Aaron Cheney, one of our engineers, created a dynamic crowd system. So the dynamic crowd system leveraged control randomness to populate hell in an automated naturalistic way while staying out of the player's way. With our dynamic crowd system, we also wanted to avoid characters walking and standing in front of the camera view. Uh, it's comedic, uh, but we needed more control when staging these AI characters. So basically we had to Marie Kondo some scenes. We had a combination of dynamic crowds and static characters that sparked joy. Uh, I created some rule sets for our game designers to follow and keep in mind when looking uh, and hooking up scenes. Now that all the assets are made, it was critical to have the animations, acting, and staging to have a convincing performance. For eye tracing, uh, we wanted the crowd to react to our player characters. If our characters toast or cheers, demons and humans in a certain proximity will also start to cheers with you. So similar to Oxenfree, we never try to take player control away, like an in-game cutscene would do. Crowd placement have a purpose and story to really sell the world of hell. For example, the scene was uh, Posed with barbecuing demons on the left, and ultimately you would have NPCs standing in line for hell tacos. Uh, on the far right, you have a drunk demon throwing up, and another picking a pick and tweeting it about and posting it on Bicker. Uh, Bicker is our version of Twitter in the game. Mm -hmm. 
We also created a consistent camera guide to manage height, distance of our camera to our player characters. The game of beer pong and PC characters pay attention to the main characters as well as to react who's winning or losing. In After Party, you can drink, trash talk, and play beer pong all at the same time. Here's where staging our player characters, dynamic crowd system, static characters, and environment playing a role in making the scene work. My job as art director is to keep track of each thing that we build and design. I really follow it through from the beginning to the end of production. So the art style, uh, by finding creative workflows and bringing concept artists more into the production, it really helped bridge the gap in concept art and in-game art. We were able to solve our art problem by bringing all the engineers and designers together. Technique, have super smart engineers and designers. To have them on your side, that they understand shader work, dynamic crowd systems, game design limitations that helped us create the game successfully. Bringing them into the fold and explaining the technical problems helped bridge the gap between concept art and in-game art. Scope, create a game that fits your budget and timeline. Always weigh the risk of adding too many features. We were ambitious in making a bigger game than Oxenfree, but we succeeded. Uh, it took a while to get there, but we definitely uh, overscoped a tiny bit on this game. Skill set and team size. Lean on your team's strengths and power, challenge, and nurture a positive working environment. Artists learning from each other scale the team to the proper scope of the project. With our concept artists working in production, they were able to have more footprint in the game. Keep it small and simple. Make a simple game with few mechanics. Uh, prototype them early, make sure they hit all your design pillars. I think starting with a small vertical slice would have helped us spot troubled waters very early. Failure, don't be afraid to fail. Failure is a part of success. We were honest and supported each other in finding solutions. So there were no egos at all in pointing fingers in who made a mistake. We banded together as a team to find a solution in creating the new technique and pipeline. Collaborate and communicate. Don't be afraid to raise a red flag when problems arise. Be open to learn from each other's team members. Together, find creative ways to solve that problem. You know, don't be married to anything that you create. Be open to change and things being cut. Old monitors were just too precious and we weren't able to use any of them. Focus, with the three little words, it helped us check ourselves when it came to decisions about tone, art, and design. It kept us on the right track. Do you guys remember the three little words? We were able to succeed in creating a world that feels comedic, I know Brian Cannon, our lead engineer, is probably freaking out right now because of all the draw calls in the game. Uh, but the game has to look alive, even though dead in hell. A story of friendship that lasts uh, through time. Uh, seriously, though, uh, at night school, uh, we try to create sincere stories and create characters everyone resonates with. So, sincerely yours, Ruel. Thank you, GDC. Thank you. So please follow us on Twitter at Night Schoolers, Instagram, Night School Studio, Instagram at Ruzilla. Um, so I guess we have Q&A sessions right now.
If you guys have any questions, you can, I guess, step up to the mic. Uh, hi, uh, this was a really great talk, thank you. Um, I was Thanks. just wondering, uh, you talked a lot about the shader work that goes into creating the lighting effects and the um, textures for all the models. Um, what shader editor do you, did, you, did you guys use? Did you use like Shader Forge or, Forge or do your uh, artists just brute force the shader code? I think we, uh, I think Brian, our lead engineer, just kind of uh, used standard and uh, Unity Shader and kind of hacked into it and started to write uh, a custom script that enabled the extra uh, texture input in the standard uh, shader. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Great, thanks. I guess I'll ask a question. Um, so this might be out of the scope of the talk today, but I know in the Mr. Robot game as well as Oxenfree, there were elements of ARGs that were leading up for the marketing of the game, and I was wondering if that expanded to any point as far as this game goes. Oh, an ARG. For, uh, yeah, the Oxenfree ARG was a very specific and interesting, fun extension of the game. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps, John. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Probably. Great question. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Questions? All right. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, there's going to be a survey uh, at the end of this. Uh, you guys will probably get emails. Um, you can also catch me if you want to ask a few more questions. I'll be across the hall. Uh, but thank you very much for showing up to my talk. Thank you. Thank you.